crypto is kind of about like decentralization and free markets and like the market should decide what is good or bad. Now we are, you wanna wait for that to die? <laughs> Okay, so people used to think about Coinbase as endorsing everything, but that's, to me, that's not a very crypto ethos aligned thing. <laughs> <laughs> you can, this might actually be a good bit. You can yeah, add yeah, that yeah, in. Yeah. Hey guys, welcome to the Super Team Podcast. Uh, it's a big day, Akshay. Yeah, it's our first live podcast. It's our first live, live in-person interview. And uh, what a guest to have. Uh, Brian, welcome to India. Coinbase is officially here. Yep. If you guys get the app right now, you get 200 rupees worth of Bitcoin, if, 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 I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And uh, the event was really cool, Brian. How are you feeling? I feel good. This was a fun day. We got to do our launch event, talk about our long-term investment in crypto and in, in India. I feel like a lot of, I've learned a lot about the culture here. I got to meet the team finally in person. We have a really amazing team in India, so that's been good. Yeah, I saw that you tweeted the Wikipedia article for Jugard. Yeah. Who told you about Jugard? I think it was the person on our team, Pankaj Gupta. But yeah, my team, my team in India like told me about it, which is a really cool concept. It, I mean, obviously it resonates a lot with entrepreneurship and even at Coinbase, we very kind of unofficially had this same thing. We just didn't know it was called that. Mm. At least I didn't. Um, about, yeah, just find a way to get it done. You know, like don't get stuck. Try to get creative. That's what a lot of entrepreneurship is. Yeah, it's part of our uh, cultural fabric to do more with less, I guess. Yeah. All right, so the format of the interview is pretty simple. All right, we don't want to keep it too heavy. Uh, you're not doing a lot of media on this store, I hear. Yeah. Uh, so the pressure's on us. Yeah, so, we're so we, this is the first podcast. Like we, we, as you can see, we have a multi-camera setup. Yeah. Yeah. We really upgraded our equipment <laughs> from like this camera here. Yeah, uh, well, I want to meet with you guys because I feel like th this is the future of media. It's, it's YouTube, it's podcasts. Um, you know, once in a while we do mainstream media too, but frankly, the questions are just not as good as some of the stuff. I saw the stuff you guys sent over. It was like better research than mainstream media questions. and. Um, I just like talking to people like you more. So I'm okay. excited to get the word out. You should probably delete four questions. questions. Yeah, said that. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you for saying yes. Uh, and um, I guess we can get right into it. Yeah, so he said that our questions are great. So our first question is uh, Dogecoin or Shiba Inu? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, you know, every Silicon Valley company has some version of let's just get stuff done. Yeah. You know, Facebook had move fast, break things. I think Coinbase in the beginning had running through brick walls. Yeah. Um, what, what does it enable you to do in its best form? And does it, at the scale that you are at right now, still does it still apply? Yeah, so of course, you know, as a startup, you always have to kind of thread the needle and find the right balance, right? I think if you are too conservative and you just wait for someone to give you permission or to go figure it out, like you'll never accomplish anything, right? But if you go too aggressive, and there's, we can think of the companies who may have tried that at certain points, then you can blow the place up. So it's about finding this middle ground and you're gonna make some people who are, who've never done startups uncomfortable. They don't really understand that mindset. You know, if you're too conservative, you just never get anything done. So. I don't know, we try to find that balance and there's been tough judgment calls along the way. Like early on, for instance, in the US when we launched Coinbase, we had to figure out, um, you know, we couldn't afford, we'd only raised like maybe 300K as a startup. We, we couldn't go get money transmission licenses. And we, so we worked with um, lawyers to figure out what was a legal way to get started with something. And then we went and got the money transmission licenses later as we'd raised a series A. And, and, and so you have to just keep building and, and figure it out and try to do the right thing. That's often what we've done too, is if, when there was not clarity about what was required from a regulatory point of view, we sort of did things that we figured would be good to do if there was clear regulation to sort of go show good faith effort. And that people generally, once it became clear what we needed to do, they, they, sh they gave us credit for that. Can you give an example of the thing that you just said? That, okay, yeah. they, it, it was a regulatory gray, uh, yeah. but you had to make a choice there. Yeah, so an example was we started collecting KYC, you know, like identifying information on customers because we figured, hey, this is going to be treated like a brokerage or an exchange. Um, there's going to be AML requirements, anti-money laundering. You know, we're going to have to eventually, at least the exchanges are going to be regulated for that sort of stuff. And then self-custodial wallets might operate more like web browsers or something more like a software company instead of a financial services company. So we kind of proactively created those KYC AML programs before it was even really required in the US, for instance. Of course, now as, as you're much bigger, you're under you know, public scrutiny and spotlight. So there's risk aversion that develops within an organization. Yeah. As you hire more middle managers, I guess there are things that may, you know, that may get lost in, in bureaucracy. How do you kind of avoid that and make sure that it still feels small? Yeah, 
I mean, you're totally right. This is actually one of the biggest risks as a company grows is that it becomes kind of ossified and complacent and bureaucratic and there's, you become a, v, a vtocracy, right? Where like any of these 10 people could say no and it, and it kills it, right? So one of the things we've tried to do inside Coinbase is we have a culture of DRIs, directly responsible individuals, which means one person is the decider. Because by default, it'll be, well, six people need to say yes for anything to get done. And so if any one of them says no, you know. So I, I like to choose DRIs and then we hold teams accountable, like push down decision making. But it's your call. You know, I need you to have input from all the relevant people. But there's a very big difference between someone giving input and being a decider, right? And so we actually use a decision making framework, which really tries to codify this in the org, like who's the decider and who's giving input. We sort of label that up front and then everybody writes in their input and you can disagree, but then we ask you to sort of disagree and commit, right? Wait, so if, like you give people roles, like, okay, this, like it's very defined that, okay, this person is in charge of making the decision yeah. and this is the council around this person. Exactly. That can advise as opposed to everyone's trying to vote for like majority of whatever decision making by committee or whatever. Right. You know, one of the things that we have, so we are just the two of us between us and then we have a supporting sub DAO structure where there are leaders for different things like, you know, yeah. talent organizations run by somebody else and the accelerators run by somebody else. But uh, like one of the things that we are wondering is how, if, if you can give us advice on scaling, right? Where we don't want to give up the, the control that comes with it. But yeah. at the same time, you know, I think the only way to scale is to add more is to, people. Is to give away some. Yeah. Them. Yeah. I think that's totally right. I mean, if you're, if you're 10 people or even 100, maybe like Dunbar's number is 150, right? Okay. Yeah. That's kind of where you can know who everybody is, you know their name, what they're working on, what's their relationship. You know, once orgs scale beyond 150, I do think you need to start putting some of this structure in place because you actually don't really know even who all the people are or what they're working on. And so you do need to kind of have clear who's making decisions on what, who owns what, kind of push down decision making. It's a common failure pattern, I think, in orgs where like the founder will end up becoming a bottleneck and like every big decision gets pushed up to that person. Eventually you have to start saying, you know, I trust you and push down decision making. Um, someone on our team over here recently reminded me of that. They were like, Brian, this might be one of those moments to push it back down. You don't have to decide this one. And so. So we met with your team briefly. You have a chief of staff uh, yeah. who helps you with stuff. So what is that role? Because we have, that is one of the most popular roles in Indian startups today, by the way. Really? Uh, chief yeah. Of staff. Chief of staff. Yeah. So can you describe that role and how uh, helpful it's been for you? Well, so this is a uh, chief of staff can mean a lot of different things in different orgs. Mm -hmm. Inside our org, you know, I think of it as somebody who's kind of shadowing me on um, a lot of the, the meetings. And then Basically, you know, he's, he's standing right here. He does, he does a lot of the real work. <laughs> so is his role to be you when you're not in the room? Well, he's supposed to be fully mind mel melded with me. So right. like shadow, it, it'll have all the relevant context. And then when we need to get stuff done, it's like, okay, well, I want this team to move over here or make this decision. And so get all the relevant people in the room, you know, create that decision making framework, make it clear to them who, who's doing what. Um, and, you know, Mark facilitates a lot of the, like the executive meeting at Coinbase. I think over time, we're actually gonna build out like a team under the chief of staff and have like an office of the CEO and other executives at Coinbase have chief of staff too. But I think to me, it's been a really valuable asset. It's, it's much different than, um, you know, you need a support team of doing a variety of things, but you don't wanna have a chief of staff who's like a barrier between you and everybody else. Like, cause then you're, they're a gatekeeper and you're just not getting any of the information. But you do need someone, I think, or it helps to have somebody who can give you leverage and actually go execute on a bunch of things without you having to get in the weeds. You seem like you have, you've thought this through and you have frameworks for this, right? Like, so one of the questions that we had was, do you have a framework for what should come to you and what should not? And if you can give an example of that, yeah. uh, that'd be great. I mean, honestly, we should probably have a better framework for this, but the kind of stuff that I think about in terms of that is I like to pick you know, maybe five areas that I think are existential to the business. Usually it's, for me, it's usually like around product and engineering because that's kind of how, that's the area I'm, I'm focused on as CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and I pick maybe five or six of those and I try to be kind of in the weeds. And I'm like, I really want to make sure this one goes well. Once, I, once I'm like, this is on, its, on a path and we've had a few meetings and everything is, I have no edits to make, then I'm like, okay, great. I'm going to move on and turn my attention to something else. Honestly, if there's like some lawsuit or there's, um, I don't know, something like um, like an HR issue or something that's like below a certain threshold, I kind of don't want to be aware of it unless it becomes material to the business because you know it's taking my time and energy away from um, building the product. And to me, that's what Coinbase is all about. If we can build good products for our customers, everything else will sort of take care of itself. 
Um, so if it's above a certain threshold, I want like if we're being sued for I don't know three hundred million dollars, maybe I want to know about it. But if it's like three million dollars, I'm okay, like not knowing. And <laughs> um, I actually, it, I think preserving your time in your your time is this most scarce yeah, and valuable thing. You can't buy more of it, right? So I actually want to preserve my time and energy f to to focus on moving the ball forward in terms of products. Because if you don't do that, like you can be overwhelmed every day by just things which won't matter long term. Can you give an example of? when you like to go into absolute, like the granular of something, maybe something. from the last six months. Yeah. Usually I end up torturing the team on these things. Like they probably don't Should like Should we open the app? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like design, like oh, yeah, what do you I get mean, into the degree of? Like an example is, um, you know, right now it's fairly easy to trade in, in the app and things like that. But I'm, I think how easy is it to make a crypto payment? Mm. To me, it's still way too much friction. You know, there's issues around confirmation times, and sometimes we're asking you for two, like this two-factor authentication when you don't need it. Think about how easy it is to send a WhatsApp message versus a crypto payment. It's still, there, you know, sometimes I, I like to count taps on the app. So it's like mm -hmm. if you're a tap counter, you can be like, well, that was 20 taps. How do we get it to be like three? You know, and you have to cut out all the stuff, and you can use heuristics. And like Amazon had this metric, I think, for a while where they were so from the minute you click the buy button to that, when does that thing arrive on your doorstep, okay? That's a great high level metric, but there's like a million things in the middle of that that you might need to optimize. Everything from software to like, maybe you have to build your own airline, like to ship things faster mm -hmm. or having build new distribution centers. If you hit pay on the Coinbase app and like, how long does it take to show up as like a green check on the other person's phone? Mm -hmm. I mean, we might need to do optimistic confirmation, um, like on the blockchain. We might even need to like default to, you know, helping people select blockchains with better confirmation times if they're doing peer-to-peer -peer payments. So anyway, that's an example of the kind of thing where I'll really get in the weeds. If, if we can lower the friction on this, it'll just, that's how we get to a billion people using crypto. Has the product manager gotten upset with you? <laughs> like, Brian, why are you getting into this detail? I'm, I'm sure I irritate like lots, <laughs> lots of teams with the, with the product reviews, but um, hopefully it's in the spirit of, you know, good things. We'll yeah, see. we yeah. can see the kind of like the attention to detail in the product, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we looked at some of the partnerships you've had over the years mm -hmm. with people inside the company. I think there's something to say about how you found like a kind of a yin to your yang or, uh, to, to do this. And yeah. uh, want to be uh, so curious what you think about finding the right co-founders, what that complementary skill set should be. And then maybe we'll ask you to say a couple of lines about each of these partners at the end of that. Great. Do you have a view on how that's helped you? Because, um, yeah. and how, to, how can founders think about it? Yeah. Well, I imagine it's similar for you two. I don't know. You you have a good chemistry, complementary skill sets, but yeah. Um, I, for me, it's the same. Look, I I'm kind of like um, I'm a technical founder, right? I'm an engineer. Um, I I'm product focused. My strengths are that I'm really determined. I'm I'm not afraid to kind of lean into um, unreasonable bets mm -hmm. on the future and try things that are a little bit crazy. Um, my my weaknesses are, you know, I'm. I'm probably a little conflict avoidant, you know, I'm like not the best people manager in the world, I'm okay at it, um, but I've partnered with people like Emily Choi who are just much better on that front. Um, and you know, what else? I can, I'm a little introverted, right? Like I don't like to be on the road 200 days a year just like doing press and interviews and stuff. I like to be working with the team to build cool products with technology. That's my, that's my favorite thing. So, and hopefully, I think my role I can play in the company is a little bit of what you said earlier about risk tolerance, right? I can, I can push to us to take intelligent risks in certain situations that might be a little outside the comfort zone, but not doing anything like that's obviously wrong. So um, that's where, I don't know, I've found good partnerships over the years. Yeah. Uh, so far, okay, actually, our first partner is Emily Choice. Do you want to say something about how yeah. that's helped you? And just a couple yeah. of lines about each of these, and then we'll go on. Yeah, well, so she's, she's an amazing um, people manager. She's got in incredible talent. Um, she's recruited an incredible talent into Coinbase. She has a lot of experience in terms of like M&A. She built out Cor Coinbase Ventures, which has been incredibly successful. Having her sort of really operate a lot of the day-to-day -day business has been really great for me because it allows me to focus on product and engineering. It allows me to come to events like this. And, you know, I know everything is is good back at home. Yeah. I, I trust her and we've been in a, it's been a really great partnership. It's almost like a re a refounding of the company, mm -hmm. you know, because Fred and Fred Orson and I co-founded the company and companies go through many founding moments. And so I feel like we have another founding moment with Emily. Mm -hmm. Well, the next on the list was Fred. Was Fred, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so he and I have become lifelong friends. Like that's that's one thing I'm really proud of is that you know he and I started the company. He did decide he wanted to move on and run his own thing at some point because Fred's kind of like a natural leader. Mm -hmm. He's I mean he 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 really could have or wanted to be a CEO at some point in his life at a new company. So and he's more than capable of doing that. So I I tried to keep him as long as I could, but he was eventually going to go run his own thing. And he's now built Paradigm. Has that made your relationship better? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, after so, he's left. Yeah, so I mean, when we were building Coinbase together, we were just working like twelve-hour days. Right. Like, so we, on the weekend, if we got a day off, we like didn't want to see each other at all because it was like literally I could finish every sentence he was going to say in a, in a very good way. We had like mind melded. Um, but now that he's running his own company, like Paradigm has ended up being, I think, the largest crypto investment fund, yeah. incredibly successful. So um, yeah, he and I have had more time to really just hang out as friends and like that's that's been really cool and of course he's still on the board of coinbase so yeah but yeah he he was that complimentary skill set in the early days especially when i was like wanting to just write code and you know build the product and he was he was doing everything like um going meeting with regulators fundraising he's tougher and more like um higher disagreeableness than me right so if there was like I can do that stuff, but like I, I don't love doing it. And if there's if there was like a hard conversation or fourteen of them to go have, like he's like, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who does that now? Yeah, Emily does that. The exec team does it. Yeah. Um, and I and I do it when of I course. need to. Yeah. yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Balaji Srinivasan. Okay, Balaji is a very unique individual. Probably one of the most uh, brilliant people that I know. I think he's a, he's a genius in the true sense of that word, and he's a complete visionary, right? And so usually the funny thing about Balaji is like he'll tell you something, and you're like. Dude, that's crazy. That doesn't even make any sense. And then, you know, a year later, you'll be like, oh my God, he was kind of right. His biggest thing is like, he's telling you the future. He's living in the future. He's seeing 14 steps ahead on the chessboard. And usually um, when he tells you that stuff, it sounds nuts. And then you realize he, he was on to something. He, he turned around a lot of stuff at Coinbase that was like, you know, we were growing and we had these Gen 1 systems that needed to get upgraded to Gen 2. And he was just, he doesn't suffer fools. He was like, I'm gonna go in there, and if you can't explain it to me, like I'm gonna make you uh, put someone else in charge if you can't fix it. Like he was just, you know, he was he was pretty like very effective as a leader in turning things around. Like he's almost more of an academic or a thought leader, I think. Like, and he's writing all these papers. I'm really excited about his book that's coming out. I think that he's almost better as like someone who can tell you where the future is going and helping invest and advise these companies because he was a, he was like a good employee. He was very effective as an executive, but I think he's even better as like writing books and helping startups build the future. Like that's, I call him when I want to figure that stuff out. Awesome. Uh, the last one is Olaf Carlson. There have been a lot of startups built in India. A lot of the early employees, we're going to link to an essay in the description. It's called the dinner party metaphor, which a lot of the early employees feel. A big part of their identity is the startup. They help, they gave up their personal lives, built a lot of the company, and then they have an identity crisis, right? It's like, who are you after you leave? So you're advising all of these folks in with some context around who Olaf is and what your early partnership was like. Yeah, well, Olaf was the first employee hired at Coinbase and he, you know, his prior job was he was a lumberjack. Uh, <laughs> so he was totally unqualified on paper, but he was the most qualified person who at that time we brought in and he's just, he's brilliant. Like, he, he not only like built out, he was just sort of did anything that needed to be done, right? So he built out a customer support team. He built out a risk team. He'd go to meetups, he'd find the right people, he'd recruit them, you know. Um, I remember Fred and I, at one point early on, we had to go hop on a plane to go try to raise the Series A in New York. And at that time, it was just us three, Olaf, Fred, and I in the office. And you know, we told Olaf, like, if the site goes down, which it did frequently in those days, we were like, here's how to like, maintain you know, all the trading so that we don't lose like, you know, millions of dollars. By the way, if you mess it up, we might be insolvent and dead. <laughs> Um, and we hopped on a plane and like, sure enough, like an hour after we were on the plane, unreachable, unreachable, you know, the site went down and Olaf just like, it was like his second week on the job. He's like sweating bullets, but yeah, I'm, I'm so proud of him. I mean, he created another crypto fund, uh, Polychain, which has ended up being enormously successful. He was on the cover of Forbes magazine and like, he's now such a creative person. He's doing all kinds of things in like media and, um, incubating all times of te technology companies and stuff. So he's brilliant. All right. All right. I'm going to read this out because actually I wrote this and <laughs> now he's putting it on me. Your blog post on being a mission-driven company yeah. generated quite a response within the Valley. Though it seemed like a consensus view outside of it. Outside of Silicon like, Valley. How has it been yeah. after inside the company and outside uh, since then? Look, the mission, the mission focus thing was like a really important moment in the company and in my own leadership, right? It felt like for a while there, 
things were increasingly getting uncomfortable at work. Mm -hmm. There was people sort of holding the exec team to account, which mm -hmm. was like, that was the first time I'd, I thought we were all on the same team, but it started to feel like there was this internal mm. competition or division. We, start, we actually got like a list of demands at one point mm -hmm. from a group of employees. I was like, I thought we were on the same team. We don't send demands to each other, you know? So it started to feel strange. We had these um, open mic kind of Q&A things as well, which a lot of Silicon Valley companies have. That was usually, we were always talking about like products and what are we building and the mission and the culture. Most, it got to a place where like majority of the questions I would say were about things unrelated to Coinbase. They were just about broad societal issues. And it almost became a little bit of this game of like, how can we make the exec team squirm the most mm -hmm. um, on, on this, these open mic kind of situations, right? At a certain point I realized um, we were not on the same page. There was this kind of growing, and I was kind of walking on eggshells, frankly, inside the company, because I didn't really know how to deal with this. And this culminated with a walkout, actually. Some employees just like, in protest, walked out of the company, um, and that had never happened before. It was kind of shocking. So I realized at a certain point I had to address this. I was like, we gotta get the company back in alignment. Mm -hmm. I'm failing as a leader if I'm not providing clarity here, and I think, it's better to have people all be on the same page than to have um, just be sweeping it under the rug, right? So this mission-focused post was my attempt to say, um, we're not gonna focus on broader societal issues we're, we're, unless they relate to our mission. So we're just gonna focus on building our mission. Economic freedom is a really important mission. It has all kinds of positive things in the world. And this is kind of like my personal philosophy. I feel like there's a lot of hard problems to solve in the world, but you need it, it t usually it takes like a decades to really make a dent okay. in these things. Like, education or climate change, whatever. These are not like simple things where you can kind of do virtue signaling and say your opinion for, for 24 hours and donate some money and then boom, you're on to the next thing. It's like, let's make real change in the world, but that has to happen with focus. Obviously that post, I knew it was gonna be controversial when I put it out. To your point, it was really only controversial in places like the Bay Area, right. Portland, maybe, the, maybe Brooklyn, like even most places in the US outside of those and in Europe, I had employees like reach out to me like, what is going on over there? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. you just said we're gonna focus on work at work. <laughs> yeah. Like, what is so, I don't know, what is everyone losing their mind about? And so it did show this, there's pockets of the world that had become um, very, I, I don't know, activist mindset or whatever. I would even say it's mostly pockets of America, right? Because I yeah. used to work at a tech company that was based in the US and a majority of the employees were based outside of the US. And so on these staff calls where you'd have similar Q and A's, there'd be these questions that we just didn't understand the context of. And it almost felt like, uh, well, actually, that's, there's a privilege of being in the US, so you get to ask those questions yeah. in the US. So it's actually American-centric. It, there's a special privilege that comes to living in America that you can ask those questions that are not even relevant outside, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, totally. So. And so. you're a global company? Yeah. That is investing um, in employees around the world. You have over 300 employees already in India yeah. with a plan to ramp up to 1,000. Yeah, by can you say more? this year. Yeah, what are the employees year, doing? And yeah, for sure. So by the end of this year, hopefully we'll be a thousand employees in India. And um, we've been hiring, you know, engineers, product folks, designers. We have some customer support, um, back office functions. And I mean, look, there's just an incredible amount of talent here and entrepreneurial energy, great engineers. I, I visited IIT Delhi, which was really cool uh, to meet some of them. And they, a lot of them want to build companies too. So there's going to be many winners in mm -hmm. um, the world around crypto companies. And I, we want to support all these people building startups. In fact, one of the things I'm most proud of actually is that a lot of crypto startups have been founded by people who've previously worked at Coinbase. And so I do think actually joining Coinbase is a way to kind of get your crypto MBA, if you will. And when people do want to move on, of course, I'd, I'd rather they stay and they build, you know, you can do entrepreneurial activity inside Coinbase. I think it's great actually also when people leave and they form companies and like Coinbase Ventures will put sometimes checks into those. And so it's like, we almost have this like Coinbase mafia out yeah. there in the world, which I'm really <laughs> proud of. Um, do you sometimes feel old being in crypto? Cause sorry, I just want to lighten things up. <laughs> Um, cause, uh, Akshay and I, we feel old all the time. Like we got, yeah. we have a DAO and yeah. we got these 15 year olds, 16 year olds who are, you know, coding products and, and crypto is a mix of like, you know, there's young prodigal, prodigal talent and then, you know, there's, you know, people with experience who are move, moving on from Web2 to Web3. Do you, yeah. uh, do you sometimes feel like you got to keep up with what's happening? Totally. Yeah. I mean, actually, honestly, I do feel old in crypto sometimes. Like I, when, in the early days of crypto, I feel like I could read. I could read the research papers and stuff when like a new chain came out or whatever. And now I'm just like learning from our team. There's so many new things on the cutting edge that I'm like, what is that? You know, and so I'm getting educated. I don't know, there was always this term like, are you, crypt, you know, crypto native, right? And who are like the OG crypto people? I don't know, I kind of don't like that term now because I feel like 
it sort of implied like there's an in group and an out group, mm-hmm. and if you weren't in in crypto before 2012 or something, like you're just you'll, you're a boomer and you'll never get it. So I, I like this term crypto forward now or whatever. We, you know, we're trying to make it like anybody can learn how to be crypto forward. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't know. I want I want crypto basically to be less tribalistic amongst mm-hmm. each other and have. How do we get the next billion people using crypto? That's the thing I really care about. It's not like which company is talking trash about the other one or which it's usually like one coin versus another. Yeah. So I'm, I feel like I'm friends with most of the other companies in the space, even if they're competitors. I'm just like, let's all hundred X the size of the industry and not like worry about getting too on each other's nerves. Yeah, I was going to ask you that saying, look, you, there are all these exchanges, there's, there's Binance and FTX. Uh, while you guys are competitors, like when it comes to regulation, like you're on the same team, essentially. Like, do you sometimes just pick up the phone on CZ or Sam and be like, hey, do you want to just talk about this? Like, do you guys ever talk? Yeah, I mean, I, I chat one 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 with them or we message or whatever. Um, you know, whenever there's opportunities to collaborate, I'm always happy to do that. I, I've done that with both of them. And, you know, I, I'll give them both credit there. I think they're moving the ball forward in various policy conversations around the world in a really thoughtful way. Like that, honestly, we're not even covering some of those areas. and I'm glad they're doing it. Um, you know, we all take slightly different approaches, but I think it's... Um, you know, it's it's all in the spirit of growing the industry. Mm-hmm. There's a quote that I read. Someone was speaking about Brian that said he has a pathological need for self improvement. <laughs> uh, what are you trying to work on right now? <laughs> well, that's kind of true. I guess um, I've always been interested in self improvement. I, I love learning things, and then I love. Uh, building things with technology. So even if I was like, I don't know, alone in the middle of the woods for like five years, I would probably be building stuff somehow with, a, you know, an ax and wood or something or just trying to learn things and read books. Yeah, so I mean, actually in my 20s, I like read a bunch of books on like self-improvement and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, even to this day, I like to write down my goals and like try to surround myself with friends who are like thinking bigger and crazier thoughts. And I love, I love it when people like you know, I was thinking in this range and someone's like out here. I'm like, whoa, that's okay. Now it shifted my, my thinking. What am I working on now? Let's see. Um, well, I am working on pushing down decision making, not getting so in the weeds. I'm working on being... Do you just not reply to emails then? That, that comes, you're like, I'm, if I don't reply, people will understand that I'm not going to make a decision on this. What's the tactical tip for well, founders? The, be- the better way to do it is to literally tell them, like, I trust you, you're, you're the decider. <laughs> but I probably miss a lot of emails, too, to be honest. Yes, there, there's, we're at a place where there's to, every channel gets overloaded. Email, then, then WhatsApp, then, you know. I'm working on just, like, unconditionally loving people and, you know, not being judgmental and just having a broader picture of, like, team human and how do we move the ball forward and, um, you know, Coinbase is, it has a, is an incredible platform and we now have all these resources and people to try to do good things in the world with economic freedom. We went public last year and so that gave me some liquidity and now I'm thinking about like, I don't, I don't understand how to do philanthropy well. I think like, it just like startups, most, you know, philanthropic stuff probably is not very high quality, but there's a small group that is. So I don't know, I want to just keep building companies. I, I, one thing I, I'm really focused on is like, I feel like Building company is so hard that oftentimes people, once they get a little bit of success, they're kind of like, oh my gosh, finally I could take a break or, you know, I just want to invest money or like write a book or advise or something. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I, I want to keep building. And so I try to think about like, how do I make building companies sustainable where I can keep doing it for decades and fun. If it's not fun, you're not going to keep doing it. Like, so we're not, none of us are doing it for the money at this point. It's like, we're doing it because it's fun. So if it, it, you have to really work hard to make sure it is fun. Like if you're ever, like one of the things I do actually, just in terms of self-improvement is like maybe twice a year, I do like a calendar audit or an energy audit, if you want to call it that. And I basically go look at my calendar for the last two weeks and like literally every half hour block or whatever, I mark, did, did this like raise my energy? Was it neutral or did it go down? And then I try to look for themes. And if there's ever a theme of like, you know, that kind of activity mostly is making my energy go down, Mm. then I try to think about, all right, I'm just going to delegate it to someone else or do it differently or just stop doing it entirely. And if you don't continually like tend the garden like that, I think most founders get burned out or it shows up, they just become very stressed or like you see stress manifest in all these ways. Like, you know, they'll be on like get addicted to something or like they'll just burn out or whatever. Um, and quit randomly or yell at their team. And it's just because they're stressed. And so managing burnout, energy calendar audits. I, I've had, a great one. <laughs> yeah, I've had a lot of really good exec coaches over the years too. So I think coaching is really helpful. Um, having a group of friends that are other founders you can talk to, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, is it fair to say you're somewhat left brain biased? You're deeply analytical. And so if you have, you, you, 
you'd analyze your way into something rather than intuit your way? Yeah, that's that's definitely my default. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably like a little bit on the spectrum, like Asperger, so I default like analytical, but yeah. and sometimes like I, to a fault, I'll like have trouble like understanding someone's, like how they're feeling or whatever. Um, but I can basically, I've developed just kind of hacks in my, for my life that are like, I can, I can get by on that stuff, but I'm, yeah. So that's I'm, what I was going to ask you about. Is yeah. it, what are these left, left brain frameworks you worked around that has been most useful for you? Because there are founders like you watching you. There's already been like five on this podcast already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're asking like, what are some of the hacks that yeah. I used? I mean, let's see. Well, okay, one of the hacks that I use is in all of my one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh -huh. I basically, at the end, I try to get people to be more candid with me and tell me what they're really thinking hmm. um, because I can't often like intuit it, right? Sometimes, you know, if someone's struggling with something or they're just like being sarcastic even, like I, I don't really pick up on these cues as well. But part of the reason why I work really well with Emily is like she has like amazing EQ, EQ. and she can just tell instantly what everybody needs and how they're feeling at any given time. And so she's like, Brian, you need to go do this. I'm like, okay, thanks. Um, but yeah, at the end of every one-on-one, -on -one, I basically have a section where like we have to give each other feedback and two-way candor. Mm -hmm. And I have them go first. And it's funny how often, if you just say, hey, do you have any feedback for me? Most people are like, nope, everything's good. And then like, you know, like I'm usually have to force them. I mean, like, no, I, I, I need you to tell me something and um, make it okay for them to do that because they're always afraid that, like, you know, especially if you're the CEO or something and it's an uneven relationship, that they're like, Brian's gonna fire me, he's gonna get super pissed, or I, I don't know, whatever fears people have, it usually is giving them bad advice. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of continually make it okay mm -hmm. to get truth out of them. Yeah, now people know that Brian can't. Did can't pick up on sarcasm. So now everyone's just going to be sarcastic around you. That's yeah. a great idea. Sure. <laughs> yes, Brian, we should obsess about these, the single extra tap in the payment screen. <laughs> I, I love this question. Are you guys question. being serious? I, can, no, I'm just <laughs> I, want, I want to ask you this. Uh, in 2015, in the bear market, is it true that your board tried to convince you to pivot Coinbase into an, you know, an enterprise blockchain solution? Uh, how, <laughs> no. how did you... Is, is that not true? It's not true, no. I'm, actually, I'm curious where you heard that, but no, there, so there was a lot of, the part of it is true, there was a lot of discussion in the industry at that time. Like it looked... He's so kind. <laughs> <laughs> there was discussion in the industry. It, our, to, to be fair, our board, no, our board never pushed for it. Um, mm. There was, uh, we saw a lot of other crypto companies though pivot, and there was this kind of meme at that time, of course, that it's like, well, I don't really believe in Bitcoin, but I believe in blockchain. Yeah. And we saw mm. these kind of... Um, permissioned blockchains amongst banks were getting this attention. You know, for me, it was kind of an easy call because I was like, could we pivot to be making software for banks or something? Like, yeah, but I'd rather just give the money back to the investors and go do something else because I don't want to do that. Hmm. Um, like, you know, if we had to build a better version of Swift or something, like, that's probably good for the world, but um, it wasn't exactly what I wanted to spend my time on. So people give us all this credit of like, wow, they never wavered in the deepest of crypto winters. The price was kind of going down for like three years. Yeah. And I think we had maybe like 25% of the company left. Um, so there was like high turnover. Um, I remember like reporters at conferences would come up to me and be like, well, now that crypto is dead, what are you guys going to do next? I'm like, I think we're just going to keep working on it. I, I don't have any good answers for you. So yeah. So anyway, we stuck it through and that turned out to be really valuable because um, we, I think actually the biggest gains sometimes are made in down markets mm. where you, you do pick up the people who are like true believers. Correct. Mm. Yeah. So companies are built in bear market. Yeah. Bear market. December 2017, you had four assets, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash and Litecoin. By March 2021, you obviously have hundreds of assets and Cryptarium, a $36 million market cap coin, which a lot of people on Twitter made fun of, saying, how does yeah. Coinbase list assets? Yeah. Obviously, you guys don't express a view on what coins, so I wanted to give you a chance to talk about how you think about listing yeah. and um, how teams that are building around the world uh, can work with Coinbase to be a part of the ecosystem. So this is a great topic. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, yeah, we've gotten a lot of flack for that a little bit. So I think um, here's how I think about it. Like in the, in the old traditional way of thinking, um, Coinbase was sort of like endorsing a coin every time we listed it, right? Mm -hmm. But part of that was just that, um, frankly, we were just catching up and, and building a lot of our systems to be more robust and adding support for a lot of this stuff. We never really wanted it to be like us as the, the gatekeeper or the endorser of coins. To me, that's actually very against the ethos of crypto. Like in the past, people always thought when we listed a coin, we were endorsing it. And 
just because we had we didn't have our systems built out fully, so we had only had support for a few assets. And to me, that that never really aligned with the ethos of crypto. I wanted it to be more like you know decentralization and free markets. And anyway, we're a regulated financial service business. We can't just list anything, but we have so we have created these very rigorous listing standards. And we've said, okay, there's a test of legality for compliance. We want to make sure there's not a scam or something weird happening. We test, we check for cybersecurity, make sure there's good consumer protection. But if it meets our listing standards, then we then we want to list it and let the market decide. Because like a lot of developers may resonate with this example where, you know, you tried to get your app in the app store or something, okay. and Apple rejected it, and then oh well, they had this competing one that kind of got approved, and this and it's a black box. So like, I always felt like I didn't want Coinbase to become that. And in fact, DEXs, decentralized exchanges, to me are really exciting for that reason. We we actually support DEXs in the app now, and the reason is that. I want there to be more like a true crypto economy that's that's more permissionless, more decentralized. So nobody nobody really gets frustrated when like something gets listed on Uniswap. It's Correct. just sort of there by default. Now, of course, anyway, we're centralized. We have to follow the listing standards and make sure it's very rigorous. But as long as we're not listing something that ends up being a scam or something, and, and we'll we'll delist stuff over time. Yeah. Um, I want it to be like give the benefit of doubt to a startup because mm -hmm. um, like there's a chicken and egg problem. How do you get your first thousand customers? And you know, I think we can basically, just to wrap the thought, we can do a lot with um, ratings and reviews, basically to give customers more information. And like if, on Amazon, if there's a product that has three, three out of five stars or something, like you can still buy it if you want, but the community is sort of telling you something. If it's like one star and it, maybe the product is fraudulent, then they're gonna delist it. So I, I want us to be a little bit more like the Amazon of assets, not a walled garden like, like Apple's I, uh, App Store or something like that. That's a good way of putting it, but also like, uh, it's, there's a lot of times retail doesn't necessarily know what's what's good for them. Yeah. yeah. In fact, retail will probably do one star saying, token went down, this is a bad token. Yeah. <laughs> right? So yeah. I'm not sure how the review system might work. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a good chance that, you know, in three months if Bitcoin keeps going down, Bitcoin's at one star. <laughs> Everyone's like, what is going on? I doubt Bitcoin will ever go to one star, <laughs> but I, I agree with your general point. I think, I've, one other thing I forgot to mention, so um, we're launching assets now in something called... Um, like our experimental zone. So if there is, it's basically like there's a, there's a set of questions you have to answer. It's like, hey, are you an advanced trader? Like, you know, it's ah. a test of um, financial literacy kind of because I, I, it's just like if you're a developer and you have a brand new app, you should have a way to beta test it, but it doesn't mean you need to be able to blast it out to like millions of retail customers. So we're trying to find the right balance around things it's like that. Experiment zone. Experimental zone is sort of the way, the label that we're applying to a lot of these small market cap assets. You know, well, I mean, the other side of this is, you know, if you don't list these, you know, we know we met a team that's got a completely on-chain asset management protocol that's live and yeah. they're $2.5 million market cap because there's no way for them to financialize the, the protocol, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the other side of it. If you don't actually list them, it's to your point on chicken and egg not having, yeah. you know, how do they get access to market access, right? Yeah. You're now a fully remote company, which means you don't have a centralized physical location in, you know, as offices. Is part of the effort also to decentralize the company's uh, role in managing customer assets uh, and reduce the risk over time? Would you ever consider self custody kind of hardware? Is that uh, is that kind of on the roadmap? Yeah. So just to clarify, so we're it's a slight difference, but we're not fully remote. We're remote first, and what that means basically is that um, everybody has to operate as if you are remote. But you can go in if you want to go into an office. You can. It's just no one's required to. And if you, if you go into the office, you have to operate in a way that's um, you know, compatible with the remote team. So you have to like sign into video conference here, not like do a meeting in person where remote people can't join or mm. something like that. Mm. But yeah, I mean, to your point, it does. This kind of fits into the ethos of crypto a little bit. It's, it is yeah. crypto is um, decentralized. It, look, we're we're very big uh, believers in self custody as well. So we have um, a self custody wallet. It's like I think the second largest one out there is Coinbase Wallet. And so um, a lot of the innovation is happening in self-custody. We have support for hardware wallets, for instance, with um, Coinbase Wallet. The, the Will we get a Coinbase hardware wallet? Because uh, the UI on a lot of these wallets is not very, uh, let's say, one, next one billion people friendly. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I mean, we, we've done a partnership with Ledger that has like some, bra some branding, but it's a big question. Like, I don't see a billion people carrying around a separate hardware wallet, but they all have cell phones. It's a really interesting question of, um, like the secure enclave on some of these devices is getting more like interesting from a developer point of view. I think that's really interesting long term, especially you know if Apple and Google don't really, 
it's going to be very unclear. Like Apple so far has not really played nice with crypto. They've actually like banned a bunch of features that we would like to have in the app, but they just won't allow it. And so there's there's potential antitrust issues there. I think also, you know, there's going to have to be like crypto compatible phones that I think could actually become quite popular in the future. So anyway, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Crypto right. compatible phones is a great idea. Yeah, Coinbase, uh, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> Coinbase is <laughs> launching their... Uh, uh. <laughs> if you would put up a billboard addressed to the following people in India, what would it say? And it's going to have as many words as you want. One, uh, the institutional investors in India. Get started now. <laughs> I don't know, I think like the US, in the US retail went first, institutions followed. Forward thinking institutions were like small crypto focused funds and things like that. But now it's like pension funds, endowments, like the most conservative institutions are now like most of them are doing crypto. So you can just see the trend playing out in other countries. Like why not start it here? You'll be one of the first uh, crypto institutions in India. Banks. Banks? Um, I don't know what I would say to banks. I think um, <laughs> lean in, like be a part of the solution. I don't know. I think banks aren't going to go away. They, it, there's a big business to be built uh, with banks and crypto. Maybe, th to, honestly, to them, they'd probably laugh at that. Like they'd say, you think we're going away, you're going away, right? I, don't, I mean, neither one is going away, right? People want crypto. They also want to use banks. Banks are going to increasingly find ways to build businesses with crypto. Um, okay, have, have you thought about how they could? Yeah, well, I mean, the simplest function thing that's been happening today is people who are storing money in banks want to get it into crypto, so there's pay payment rails. But, you know, the other thing is that I think increasingly you're going to see banks actually enable custody of crypto for their customers, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, I don't want to name any names, but there's a bunch of banks that are talking to our team about Coinbase Cloud and things like, how can we enable white-labeled custody inside our banks? Um, or, or the major um, institutional custodians. So a lot of those conversations are happening right now. All right, if you say this to Indian banks, they would probably laugh. So they're going <laughs> to wait for the American banks to do it, yeah. uh, do it first. Uh, students. To me, this is like the birth of the internet. So now's the time, you know, um, get in early, build something cool. If you, if you have entrepreneurial ambitions, get crypto savvy, get crypto educated. Um, you can take classes online. You can do it at some universities. You can do an internship at places like Coinbase and other crypto companies. But yeah, to me, this is like the early... 2000s and the internet's just getting started and like this is the future come come build it with the pension funds endowments all moving out on the risk curve yeah um you know they were four speculators in tech in web 2 style tech but now they're also they're holding crypto assets you know bitcoin has grown 200 percent cagr over the last 10 years yeah which means they are funding fewer there's less force speculation in web 2 like startups mm. would you agree with that and would that cause a valuation reset uh to the downside for web 2 startups I'm not sure exactly what you mean by f like a forced valuation reset. Um, I mean, there's a lot of like growth tech stocks have just kind of come down generally. It's probably more due to like interest rates and things like that. But are, are you asking whether people are going to move money for, into Web3 versus Web2 companies? Well, or, do you yeah. think the institutions that are funding these Web2 startups will, will go back to funding them now that there's crypto? Is crypto a new growth stock? Crypto is kind of being embedded into most of the new companies that are getting formed. I, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're asking, but you know, like Web2 is not going to go anywhere. These are big companies. It's like arguably Microsoft like hasn't had a massive new product in like 20 years or 10 years or something, right? It's basically Windows and Office and that's fine. They're doing a lot of M&A, like Satya is doing a great job. But it's, so it's not like Microsoft is disappearing. In fact, it's growing. Web3 is also going to be big. So I just think that Web3 and having like a crypto component of most new startups is, is a very unstoppable trend. And a lot of these investors and institutions are going to start putting more and more money into those companies. Would that include Coinbase? Hopefully. All yeah, right. we're, a public, we're a public company now. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Let's, okay. uh, have, you, have you been paying attention to any of the Coinbase Ventures investments in India? Is there anything that you found interesting? Well, um, I mean, we've been tracking their progress. Like they're all growing really well. There's recently there was this regulation about um, India taxing crypto investments, right? Which generally was interpreted as a good thing. Like I think everybody was afraid it was going to be a ban or something. Which because they acknowledged it. Yeah. 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 So look, a thirty percent tax is kind of punitive, and there, there's like a one percent tax on like yeah. every transaction. So I think, look, they uh, they came out and they. They were like, probably they wanted to ban it, but the Supreme Court wouldn't let them. So like they came out with something that was punitive. I get, I get why that's the case, because they have like fear and, and maybe some under, like not all the facts about, you know, illicit usage is very tiny and all these things. 
But this is not uncommon. We've seen this in a lot of countries where it starts with initially skepticism. There's some way to, for people to use it, but it's not low friction. And then as more and more of the people, because the people want it in general, and sometimes there's various parties in the government that are skeptical, but if the people want it, the politicians will then, in a democracy at least, will then eventually start to support it, and the politicians usually appoint the regulators. So that's, that's the place that it goes to. And I, I do think it's really, you know, it's re critically important for India to embrace that, because like, you know, the autocracies of the world, China or whatever, are gonna, just like the internet, they're gonna try to restrict it, lock it down, um, you know, and India as a democracy, and basically everywhere in the free world, I think crypto is gonna be legal and regulated, but it's gonna be mostly a big opportunity, and m mitigating the risk is like a minority portion of it. And the India team, right? They're conventionally companies that have come to India. The India, the Indian, uh, the Indian office usually is at an arm's length from the American HQ. Like, have you had have you had any thoughts of how the Coinbase India is going to operate? Have you had a conversation with the team saying, "Hey, this is how I'd like you guys to work"? Pushing down decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, we have offices in different places around the world. Well, and, and I should say, you know, it's remote first, right? So, but we have um, hubs in certain cities where there's more people, for instance, whether they're working in the office or not. And generally, what we've done is um, we've clustered around certain time zones. So there's, you know. Um, there's one in Asia, like plus or minus three hours, and people in various countries, in Singapore and Japan and India, and they kind of all, what's key is that you need to have like, again, clear owners, like who's, who's the regional director and who's the site lead in each of those places, and what are those people working on? Like, it's, I think it's better for morale in those places to have clear products and areas of ownership. And then, you know, we have, so we have one time zone clustered around like Asia Pacific, we have one clustered around like UK, Ireland, you know, Africa, and another one, around um, US and Latin America time zone that covers you know, anything from Hawaii to New York and like California is sort of in the middle. And so each of those, we have different leaders and we have different areas of ownership. And you know, I, obviously the exec team like tries to make appearances here and there, but in a COVID world, they have autonomy and they have ownership. And so you know, I guess we have 24 seven coverage. It helps with things like site reliability and sales and you know, customer support. You need to be able to have people respond at all hours even if it's not in that region. So those things all help. Are you the crypto guy amongst your friends and family now? And do they still irritate you asking you what tokens to buy? So I, I guess, yes, I am the crypto guy. Although I feel like all my, my family like ends up watching all this crypto stuff now too. Probably your videos too. Um, you know, I, I don't think we have any viewers. <laughs> it's mostly for us. Good, that's, that tends actually to be, if you're, doing, if you're having fun, the rest of it doesn't really matter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Turns out a lot of people like to see people just having yeah. fun. But yeah, they've stopped asking me what coins because I keep telling them about material non-public information and I can't tell you anything. Yeah. So that, they got that over with quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 I saw a tweet on your timeline uh, which says defense against the dark charts. That's a Harry Potter reference. Are you into Harry Potter at all? No. I actually didn't even realize that was a reference to Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. uh, what does your Twitter timeline look like? Who from crypto Twitter do you enjoy their tweets? Uh, do you know Inverse Bra? I really want to ask you this. No, I haven't heard of that. Should, oh, I, follow, okay. should I follow them? Right. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Inverse Bra is like crypto Twitter's uh, history keeper, bookkeeper. I don't even know. It's a, do you know what a Wazi is, Brian? Oh, wow. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, do you have a favorite crypto meme? Uh, there's a bunch of these. There's there's Hortle, there's you know rocket emoji to the moon. There's yeah. the IQ, IQ bell curve meme. Have you, have you, have you seen that? Yeah, system? yeah, the midwit or whatever. The, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of good ones with that. I don't know. One of my favorite crypto memes is like it's that one from the Matrix where you know he's like um, Morpheus, yeah. like, are you telling me that someday I can sell my Bitcoin for millions? He's like, no, Neo. Um, when, when you're ready, you won't have you to, won't have right? Uh, so uh, that's like the mind blower one. It's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> the whole world might run as this is the new yeah. reserve currency. Like that, that one I love. So. Yeah. All right. So brands clearly not into too many memes. So whoever's yeah. watched this episode, send them the best crypto meme that you've seen. Yeah, yeah. actually, that'd be great. I love that. And, and, and uh, explain in one tweet what inverse bra is <laughs> to Brian. Brian. <laughs> we have to introduce him to uh, uh, Bazi's and inverse bra. On that note, uh, Bran, thank you so much. This is, this is our longest podcast so far. You've been extremely gracious and we're very happy. Coinbase is here. We're very happy to have been part of the launch. Yeah, and if thank you, need you for anything, doing this. Um, if you need some decisions to be put down, yeah, uh, yeah. very guys. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna, maybe you guys can help us build, you know, our media arm and like just get more content out in the world about crypto. I'll, I'll push down the DRI decision-making for you guys. Oh, all right. Sounds <laughs> perfect. Sounds great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Thanks. Brian.